Today we will be looking again at Daniel chapter 11 and the name of this study is going to be Antichrist Peaceable Rise to Power. In our last study I gave you mostly the historical account of Daniel 11 verses 1 through 32. Today I'm going to go back and touch on a few things in those verses that are pictures of the future and then I will continue on into the chapter. I hope you get pen and paper to take notes. I won't be able to cover everything, but I'll try to give you comparable verses to look up for yourselves to help you get the picture more clearly. I encourage you to study for yourself. As always, be like the Bereans who search the scripture daily to see if what Paul told them was true. None of us are 100% correct. Study and see what the Holy Spirit has to show you. A lot of times he shows me something later that I'm saying, uh-oh, I need to go back and correct some stuff. But when the Antichrist first comes on the scene, he will come in peaceably. Let's look back at Daniel uh, chapter 11, verses 20 through 21. In history, a murder took place, and then Antichus Epiphanes took over. And in his estate, the murdered one's estate, shall stand up a vile person, Antichus, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Verse 24 also says he shall enter peaceably, Verse 21 also says he will obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Verse 32, he will corrupt people by flatteries. In these verses, we get the picture of Antichrist coming in peaceably and flattering everyone to get their allegiance. It's been done many times before and people still fall for it. Like the historical person in verses 20 through 21, Antichrist will be murdered. Satan will indwell his dead body then, and when he rises, he will stand up more than just a vile person. Historically, it was Antichus Epiphanes picturing the future Antichrist. The League or Peace Treaty he instigates will involve Israel and the Arab countries. We know that because there will have to be some kind of agreement in place during the tribulation for Israel to have their temple on the Temple Mount where the Islamic shrine now sits, which for years battles have raged over that place called the Dome, Dome of the Rock. And I expect you have already read Daniel chapter 11. So a lot of this I'm just taking for granted. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, so read it or listen to the last study if you don't. Antichrist comes in peaceably and he will have false prophets full of devils to support his agenda. The Old Testament prophets and also New Testament scripture warn us of the false prophets. Jesus warned us of false prophets. Jeremiah 6, 13 and 14 says, For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. Money, money, money. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, every one dealeth falsely. They have said, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Jeremiah 8, 10 through 11 says the same thing of the prophets and the priest. They have said, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Ezekiel 13, 10 and 16, speaking of the prophets, God says, They have seduced my people, saying, Peace, and there was no peace. They prophesy and see visions of peace, and there is no peace. The message of peace and prosperity sells. Christians are peaceful and prosperous, but uh, we have a lot of trouble, too, going on in this world. And uh, we don't always prosper money-wise. It's spiritually that we prosper, and we do prosper a lot. But this is talking about false priests who, 
whose thing is money, 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 the outstanding characteristic and power, money and power, the outstanding characteristic of the Antichrist at first and those who support him will be the emphasis he puts on peace. And of all the world getting along and being united as one big, loving, happy family, the spirit of Antichrist is in the world today and we can easily see it all around us. And we've been warned. First John 4, 3 and Second John 7 tells us there are many deceivers in the world today and God calls all of them Antichrist, even the false prophets and false priests, false preachers who are here today. He calls them Antichrist. The deceivers and false teachers we see today are the forerunners of the Antichrist and the false prophet. And we must not be deceived. The prophets warned us. Jesus warned us. Apostles warned us. We have a Bible that warns us where we can see it for ourselves. We have no excuse. Isaiah 30 verses 9 through 11 says people close their ears to the word of God and desire to hear peace, peace when there is no peace. Daniel 8 25 and through his policy that of the Antichrist also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. There'll be lots of jobs and he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many. The white horse rider in Revelation 6 comes in peaceably as an imitation of the Messiah, and some will believe it for a while. Many will believe it. He conquers through peace. You see, he has no arrows for his bow. After he makes a league with the gullible people, he works deceitfully, and he later breaks the peace agreement, Daniel 11:23. And what follows this white horse rider who comes in so peaceably and patting everyone on the back with flattery, what follows him is that peace is taken away from the earth and death, hell, and famine follow. Look at Revelation 6, 1 through 8. At the beginning of the trip, a white horse rider appears, has a bow, no arrows. He appears peaceably. He has a crown and he goes forth conquering and to conquer. He's imitating Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Prince of Peace. Many will be deceived. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red and power was given to him that set thereon to take peace from the earth that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Then famine and death and hell follow. So when you hear someone crying, peace, peace, when there is no peace, beware. And especially beware when it is said by a religious leader that allows himself to be called Holy Father. Jesus said, don't call any religious leader Holy Father. Don't call any religious leader Father. That's reserved for God. Uh, so don't, don't be taken in by someone who would allow himself to be called that and one that the news media and the world bows down to and rolls out the red carpet for him. He might just be a forerunner of the false prophet in Revelation 13. He may just be the Antichrist. On November the 11th, 2022, I read an article by Carol Glatz in the Guffine Catholic newspaper, uh, which said, Traveling as a sower of peace to the kingdom of Bahrain, Pope Francis further strengthened ties with the Muslim world. His message promoting the peaceful coexistence of different cultures also included the wider Persian Gulf region. Peace is built with encounter, patient negotiations, and dialogue, and it is based on justice. Prayer and fraternity are our weapons. In the article, Pope Francis again condemned the world's arms trade, calling it the commerce of death, and stated it is turning our home into one great arsenal. He is quoted in the article as saying, The God of peace never brings about war, never incites hatred, never supports violence. Who is he kidding? 
Has he never read the Bible? Do you believe a man or do you believe God's word? It is plainly stated in Exodus 15, 3, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name, and he calls his followers soldiers. 2 Timothy 2, 3-4 Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. The ministry of a Christian is spiritual warfare. Our armor and how to use it is described in Ephesians 6. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 34, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Hey, he made a whip and drove the money changers out of the temple. And when Jesus does return to earth to set up his peaceful kingdom, the armies which were in heaven will follow him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And we read too that blood will come up to the horse's bridles during that battle. He hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. That's in Revelation nineteen fourteen through 16. Jesus Christ is called the Prince of Peace in Isaiah 9, 6. And only when the Prince of Peace comes again and puts down all the nations who choose to follow Satan and sets up his kingdom, only then will there be peace when the Prince of Peace comes. And that will not happen until the end of the tribulation. Jesus said, until then, mother will be against daughter, daughter will be against mother, daughter-in-law against uh, mother-in-law that I come to bring division to the earth. There, there's got to be a choice made. Will it be Jesus or will it be Satan? Uh, oh my goodness. <laughs> the God of peace never brings about war, never incites hatred, never supports violence. He told many people many times to wipe out whole nations throughout the Old Testament. Whole nations will be wiped out when he comes again so that he can set up a peaceful kingdom. Believe your Bible. Believe your Bible. Forget about what man says. Read your Bible. Study your Bible. Believe your Bible. And beware of false prophets. Do not listen to anyone who changes, takes away from, or adds to the Bible. Well, you know, okay, you know there is confusion over, well, which Bible is the Word of God? I don't think a lot of people even think about it, but you got to admit it's confusing when you're trying to follow along when somebody's reading and it don't look like your Bible at all. God is not the author of confusion. If you believe what the Bible says, and it says God is not the author of confusion, I did my research years ago, and I had to change my mind about what I thought about God's Word because He says that uh, not, not one jot, not one tittle will pass away and that He will preserve every word of it and that we're to live by every word of God, every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So if we're to live by every word somewhere in this world, we have to have every word just as God wants us to have it. So I had to do my research, had to change my mind on a lot of things, had to apologize to one of my pastors that I got in a little uh, dispute with him over the King James Bible and the other versions. <laughs> but after seeing for myself that the King James Bible is the Bible, the Word of God, not just a version, um, I had to apologize to him, and I didn't mind it a bit. I was so glad to see the truth. Um, so there's no confusion at all once you once you come to the realization that, hey, this is the Word of God. If I don't understand it, I just need to dig a little deeper, read a little more, pray a little more, 
until the Holy Spirit gives me understanding. So the Antichrist comes in peaceably speaking lies and actually everyone at the Peace Summit will be speaking lies to each other. We read all about that last time. Daniel eleven twenty seven. they shall speak lies at one table. Daniel nine twenty seven tells us that the covenant or peace agreement will have been a seven-year agreement, but in the middle of the seven years, Antichrist will break the covenant. Psalms 55, 20 through 21, He hath put forth His hands against such as be at peace with Him. He hath broken His covenant. The words of His mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet were they drawn swords. So, coming on down in the middle of the tribulation, Antichrist will be assassinated. Find Revelation 13 in your Bible and uh, follow along there as I, I tell you what it says. Uh, or at least be sure and go back and read it. Be sure and go back and read um Revela uh, Daniel 11, 20 through, through wherever we get to today. Because I know I'm skipping a lot, but I just taught the other lesson. So like I said, I'm expecting you will, you will know <laughs> what I'm talking about when I leave something out. Uh, if you don't, go back and listen to it and you will. Or go back and read it and you'll catch on. Okay, so in Revelation 13, verses 3 and 11 through 13... Antichrist is assassinated. At the same time that happens, Satan is no longer given access to heaven. You know, he comes there now from time to time as the accuser of the brethren, like he did Job. He goes up there and accuses us. But in Revelation 12, 9, he is kicked totally out to no more be able to come there again. And this is in the middle of the tribulation. At that time, he comes down when Antichrist has died. He comes down to fully indwell the dead body of the Antichrist. And the man of sin, also known as Antichrist, rises from the dead as the son of perdition. And this is Satan incarnated in a fleshy body. So Antichrist rises from the dead as your worst than worst nightmare could ever be. Talk about vile. This man is contemptibly vile. There's no word to describe his vileness. He's Satan in the flesh. He takes over everything and promotes himself to be God, what he's always wanted. The Antichrist first had appeared as a great political smooth talking figure that everyone comes to love. So this is the prophetical picture of the historical happening in Daniel eleven twenty through 21 that we studied in our last lesson. The man of sin dies, is resurrected. In his estate, a vile person shall stand up, also known as the son of perdition, Satan in the flesh. Verse 23 would picture when the man of sin first came into political power and started becoming strong with the small people. That might mean with a few supporters, a few people with a lot of money, and a lot of money means a lot of political influence and power. I did several YouTube studies on Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 that you might also want to go back to refresh your memory uh, about because there we talk about the little horn rising up, which is the Antichrist. So I need to go back and refresh my memory on it too. So in Daniel 7, 8, we saw the Antichrist as the little horn rising up from the fourth kingdom as the fourth dreadful and terrible beast who devours the whole earth. In other words, he takes over the whole world. During the tribulation, there will be a one world government, a one world order, and a one world religion a one world everything with Satan in charge, but not at first. He will wiggle his way in with flattery or maybe with a, um, a vaccination or something, a one world vaccination. You know, it's, it's coming. It's coming. A one world everything where all the world has to go along with him. In Revelation 13, 1 through 2, we have the same fourth beast, and I took the vac vaccination. Let me just say that. I don't want to start nothing here. 
but uh, but but just that the whole world was involved is why I mentioned that we've never seen that kind of thing before. In Revelation thirteen one through two, we have the same fourth beast, and there he is the combination of all the kingdoms he has controlled in the past. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. The seven heads were the kings and kingdoms of the world that he has controlled since Genesis 3. Nimrod, the king of Babel, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Cyrus, king of Persia, Alexander, king of Greece, Caesar, king of Rome. All the characteristics of the past kingdoms of the world will be combined in this one beast. So if you think about what each was known for, you'll have an idea of what the Antichrist kingdom will be like. Satan has been the god of this world uh, since the fall of man. For verses on that, you can check out 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Ephesians 2.2, 2, John 12, 31, Matthew 4, 8 through 11. He's not had complete authority, but we can see the majority of people in the world are influenced by and following him. So if you've studied any history, think about what each kingdom was known for. And think about the most wickedness that went on during the rule of each of these kingdoms. In the fourth beast, everything of each will be magnified under the rule of Satan's Antichrist. Revelation 17, 12, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. When the man of sin first comes along, he will be so smooth talking, so flattering that all the people in high places politically will go along with him. And these are the ten kings that have power with the Antichrist for a little while, long enough to help get him to the top. And uh, I'm going to have to go back and study this a little bit. Uh, I'm not sure right here if if these are the demoni, demoniac kings, and uh, I'll hit on that a little bit later, or if they're regular, well, they're regular people possessed with the spirit of Satan. The Holy Spirit's not, not here. These are going to be lost people anyway. That's another story. <laughs> the order, okay, that, so we'll, we'll get more on that next time. But the order of the last day events, the way the order happens, are important to remember because, as I've said before, there's a lot of false teaching, a lot of false teaching going on. The only way to know the correct order is to compare Scripture with Scripture. It takes a while to, to compare all that Scripture because it's all throughout the Bible. Uh, I'll read something one time and think, oh, wow, I got it. But then I'll come across something else and I'll say, well, ah, maybe not. So um, we can't just take one verse and we can't take an obscure verse to try to explain a, a uh, clear verse. We have to compare Scripture with Scripture with Scripture. And the Holy Spirit will go to go get it for you. He'll, he'll show it to you if you're sincere enough to do that. But let me just give you... The order of events, you may not believe me, but if you'll compare Scripture with Scripture, you'll see I'm right. The rapture and resurrection of all saved people during the church age may happen, and I hope it does at any time. We are living in the church age. We are the ones living in the church age. So the rapture could happen at any time. Jesus could come. Uh, unsaved people will be left behind to endure the seven years of tribulation on earth. They will have a chance to get saved during that time, but it will be super hard to get saved during then if they wouldn't accept Jesus now. And uh, thing, you know, it was so easy 
But anyway, they will have a chance, but it will be difficult. Sometime very near the end of the tribulation, there's going to be a rapture of those saved during the tribulation and of the Old Testament saints. There's going to be a rapture. That's that's uh, uh, going to happen near the end, maybe four to six months before the end. We know it's going to happen because they are going to be with us at the marriage of the Lamb, which is next to happen. Then after the marriage of the Lamb to us Christians who are now living, we're the ones, we're the bride of Christ, we will all come back to earth following behind Jesus. And guess what? There's going to be some saved during that time, that short, short interval. You know, those uh, ten virgins that had their, their oil in their lamps, but then five of, them, five of them went back and they didn't have any oil. So five went with him to the marriage. They, they were with us at our marriage of the Lamb. And then when we come back to earth, there's going to be some waiting who got their oil <laughs> at the last minute. They got saved. They got the Holy Spirit. And they're waiting for the bridegroom to return from the wedding. Those parables are found in Luke and Matthew. It's very interesting to see that. So we come back with them, the uh, tribulation saints and the Old Testament saints make up one army and we, the Bride of Christ, make up another army. Two armies come back with him. The Battle of Armageddon will be ended by Jesus. Uh, Antichrist and the false prophet will be cast into the lake of fire. Satan will be bound in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Satan will be loosed after a thousand years and go out to deceive the nations. And he will gather an army against Jerusalem and the saints of God. But before they can do anything, God will destroy them with fire from heaven. Satan will then be cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. Um, a new earth and new heavens will be made uh, while the white throne judgment is going on. God will burn everything over, purify everything, and out of the atoms and all the stuff that made up the earth he is going to create a brand new one eternity will then begin and all of this is why satan hates god's word it's why satan tries to change god's word since the garden of eden he said to eve yea hath god said and uh, they both changed god's words up then satan hates god's words and he especially hates the book of daniel and the book of Revelation because these books tell us how his end will be. So uh, I have finished the rest of the, the chapter 11 of Daniel, but I thought that would be enough for y'all to soak in today. And I hope you go back and do your homework and look up the verses I gave you, read it all for yourself. And uh, I'll be giving you the rest of, of um, Daniel chapter 11 shortly, maybe maybe tomorrow. I'm not sure. And, and I'm, I'm still hoping to do Daniel 12 <laughs> before December the 31st or by December the 31st. We'll see how that works out. So God bless you all.